So hi everyone, my name is Ronice Owens and we are pleased that you all could join us for this week's lecture in our first seven week No Neuroanatomy mini series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different neuroanatomy topics each week. The series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. We would also like to recognize our No Neuroanatomy planning group for their hard work for volume two of this mini series. We would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support for the series. And before we start, we wanna make everyone aware of our YouTube channel. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available for your viewing pleasure. And so be sure to check it out, subscribe and like our lectures. And here are some of the disclaimers for our series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later on this week. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kim Ono for today's lecture titled Neurodevelopment. So Dr. Ono is a pediatric neuropsychologist at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta in Atlanta, Georgia. And she completed her undergraduate degree in psychology at Harvard University and her doctoral degree at University of Miami in the Child Clinical Program. Her internship and fellowship were completed at Emory University School of Medicine in the neuropsychology track. Her previous clinical and research interests have spanned autism, concussion, and most recently in epilepsy. Her current clinical and research interests are in pre and post surgical epilepsy, identifying the factors that influence trajectories of cognitive outcome, as well as creating methods of assessing function. So now it's my pleasure to have Dr. Ono to give us our first lecture of this No Neuroanatomy session series. So I will stop sharing, and Dr. Ono, you can begin. So my screen okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. All right. So thank you guys for all inviting me to talk on neurodevelopment. So I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist. So obviously neurodevelopment is near and dear to my heart, but um, I'm going to kind of discuss how this may apply to adult neuropsychology as well, because a lot of times adult neuropsychologists will see patients that had a kind of insult in childhood or things like that. Disclaimers, I have no disclosures. Um, so what is neurodevelopment? Um, second, let me just move some things. Um, so neurodevelopment refers to the brain behavior relationship within the context of an immature but kind of rapidly developing brain. And child neuropsychology is the assessment and the implementation of this knowledge gained into kind of clinical practice. Um, the primary focus of the field of child neuropsychology has been kind of the generation of a developmentally informed knowledge base and that facilitates optimal understandings of the impact of early brain injury, uh, insult or disruption on the subsequent brain development and child function. And this helps guide the design of evidence-based inter interventions to minimize disability. So what we often see is a downward progression from adult neuropsychology models to kids. So in adult models, um, it kind of originally formed the basis of our knowledge of brain disorders in children. And as a, a pediatric psychologist focusing on epilepsy, we often see this, this is quite frequent that we apply adult models into our pediatric populations and use a lot of the techniques that they have as a downward progression to what can we see. Um, but it was quickly 
evident that adult neuropsychology relates to more of us kind of a static organized systems. We'll get into more detail about this later in the discussion. Um, and oftentimes they're unable to be easily accommodated to the kind of the dynamic impact of brain pathology resulting from either brain insult or environmental uh, disadvantage in early childhood. And so you can kind of see where I have stars on this, where I say that the child's brain is disorganized. And um, the star is there because to some extent it is disorganized when they're an infant, and to some extent it is very organized. Um, discuss this a little bit later. Uh, the other star is on the able to accommodate impact. Um, and we'll get into detail about this because sometimes we look at trajectories of development related to um, it, it, how, how we can improve the development versus how it can hinder the, the, the development later on. So this is the biostatic social model. And Probably everyone here has, is familiar with it or has seen this before. And so oftentimes we discuss uh, health or uh, cognitive impact related to biological factors, social factors, and psychological factors. And the likelihood that ongoing development may be influenced by an early cerebral insult or disruption in early childhood, is, this is not a novel idea. The challenges of the child neuropsychologist or even the adult neuropsychologist is to grapple with the interactions between this biologic, cognitive, social, and, and developmental factors, uh, and it kind of to reach an understanding of how these factors affect the child or you know, the later adult and lead to observed outcomes. So plasticity, vulnerability, and critical periods. And I know everybody has heard of all or at least some of these terms, and these are very important when we're talking about neurodevelopment. Um, so neuroplasticity. So Canard um, and Tuber were front, some of the first people to identify this and kind of document uh, relatively good recovery trajectories following a brain insult in young children. And the results were interpreted according to the theory of recovery of function where the young child's brain is seen to be less differentiated than that of a mature adult and kind of more capable of transferring functions from damaged tissues to functional tissues. Um, I put in parentheses, this has been debated because we'll go into detail about brain damage and whether it is really um, uh, plasticity or kind of recovery of, of function versus vulnerability and maybe you can kind of see some worse outcomes for some of these patients. Uh, plasticity refers to different things. There's functional plasticity and structural plasticity. So functional plasticity is the brain's ability to move functions from a damaged area of the brain to other undamaged areas. Um, and that's pretty obvious with the name functional plasticity. Structural plasticity, also um, pretty evident, is that the brain, the brain's ability to actually change its physical structure as a result of learning. And then, so these are kind of two different types of things where you'll actually see uh, brain structures changing versus the functions change from one area to a different part of the, the brain. Uh, critical periods, uh, of development, and we often discuss this within the terms of, of language. Um, and so consistent with these views of neuroplasticity, others have argued that the early brain insult will have a different consequent, consequence at different times throughout development. And in some instances, it may be more detrimental than kind of later injury. Uh, some examples of this are prenatal insults, so NATs or non-accidental non-accidental traumas kind of during the first few years of life appear to exhibit particularly severe impairments. And so this is what I was talking about, um, where you see kind of more detrimental effects of early insults versus what Connard had argued is that, oh yeah, we see some recovery of function when a certain area of the brain is damaged. We'll get into detail about what types of things might affect those, the severity um, of cognitive outcome later on. 
going back to critical period and language development, a lot of times parents come to, to ask me, like, how can I help my child be, um, you know, gain more cognitive skills and uh, what types of things might affect their development? Exposure is kind of the, the main thing that we, we discuss with them, exposure to different languages, or not different languages, but language in itself. Um, reading to a child is really important. Some studies have documented that bilingualism, you can be fluent in two languages, completely fluent in two languages if the child is exposed to two languages prior to a certain age, around maybe seven or eight years of age. Um, but there's also some research that have documented that children are able to pick up a second language fairly easily up until they're about 18 years old. Um, so that's kind of talking about that critical period of language development um, and why it's important for us as neuropsychologists to, to understand. Brain development. Um, and I, when I was studying for my boards, I was pregnant. And so some of these things are, if you're pregnant right now, or if you have children, you'll understand that this is kind of very uh, salient for you. But brain development begins with the formation and closure of the neural tube. Um, and so this is really early on in your pregnancy. One of the most sensitive periods of brain development is when the tube is actually closing. That's around 17 to 30 days after conception. What things might affect this aside from genetics is nutrition. So oftentimes your doctor will um, ask you to take folic acid or prenatal vitamins, and those will help facilitate that kind of uh, neural tube closure. In addition, things like alcohol and cigarette use are important. Um, things like uh, FAS or fetal alcohol syndrome, Chiari malformation, and cephalocele are all associated with kind of that early developmental kind of closure of the neural tube and exposure to toxins in, in utero. So as a adult and pediatric neuropsychologist, those are some of the questions we often want to ask our, our parents is, did this child have exposure to alcohol or drug use? Did you have prenatal care? Were you taking prenatal vitamins? Those are all important for the development of the child early on in the early brain development. Uh, brain development is often separated into two kind of qualitatively distinct stages. First stage is the prenatal stage. And so this is pre-birth. So prenatal development is primarily concerned with the kind of structural formation of the CNS um, and is thought to be largely genetically determined. And as we mentioned before, potentially some influences uh, related to nutrition as well and exposure to toxins. And um, interruptions to development during this period um, visa genetic mechanisms or in utero trauma, potentially a parent or a mother could be exposed to like a, a car accident or anything like that. Um, infections are also likely to have a dramatic impact on potentially cerebral structures. So that is the brain morphology appears abnormal. Whereas postnatal development, you will not see any kind of structural changes. It's more characterized by elaboration of the brain, in particular dendritic aberration. So the myelination or synaptogenesis might be impacted postnatally. Um, while still influenced by genes, it's also susceptible to environmental and experiential influences. So as we mentioned before about that critical period, if you're not exposed to certain types of, to language or um, to certain types of stimulation, then your brain is not going to develop appropriately. Brain damage uh, postnatally may have less impact on gross brain morphology, as we already discussed, um, but is likely to interfere with ongoing CNS elaboration and interrupt the development of interconnections and functional neural networks. So back to Neuroanatomy 101. So this is a picture of a, a neuron. So the brain is made up of lots and lots of neurons. And the baby, a baby's brain has about 100 billion neurons. 
So if you look on the left side of your screen, that's the dendrites, and this is where information is received from, from, other, from other neurons. It's processed in the, the nucleus and then it gets sent down the axon to the axon terminals and it's sent off to another adjacent neuron um, through the, the terminals. And that's called action potential or kind of the, uh, the potential of the, of the neuron. Uh, synaptogenesis is the creation of new synapses, so creating new con neural connections. Uh, and myelin is that fatty sheath that covers the axon, and this uh, helps with the electrical impulses, and it, uh, a, uh, an axon that is myelinated travels three times as fast as an unmyelinated uh, axon. Disorders that affect myelin are things like MS or multiple sclerosis, um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or EDEMS, um, things like that all affect myelin. And so you, you know the cognitive challenges that are associated with things that affect myelin are often related to processing speed and potentially motor functioning. And so those are the main things that you'll see with kind of these ADEMs and, and MS is kind of motor dysfunction as well as kind of a slow processing. Um, myelination shows increased uh, connectivity of white matter from birth through the age of 18. So you'll have myelination of your axons all the way up until 18 years of age. And so this is what uh, some neurons look like in different, in, at different stages of, of development. So at birth, you have um, less neurons and neural connections, and then three months, and this is 18 months, uh, sorry, 15 months. At one year of age, the brain is about 70% of the adult brain. And by age three, your, your brain is about 90% the size of an adult brain. And so when you look at kids, oftentimes you see like, wow, that kid has like a really big head. I, I know that for my kids, they, I look at them and I'm like, wow, their head is huge and they can't get the shirt over their head. <laughs> but so what, um, so size is, doesn't change what does. Um, during early development, the brain generates about two to three times more neurons and connections uh, than is needed to survive that function. And synapses that aren't used are removed through pruning. But you see that kind of this is explosion of the amount of neurons that are being produced, especially for our, our infants and our young children. What are the earliest developing areas. So some of the earliest developing areas of the brain are things that are control kind of we call these infant reflexes or um, things that we don't have to teach our children how to do and they already know how to do it like sucking. You don't have to teach a child most children you don't have to teach how to suck they already know how to do that right from from birth. Breathing you don't have to usually teach a child how to breathe. Beating of a heart um, and then there's those infant reflexes that you study in kind of developmental psychology, like rooting or the reflex um, where you touch the, the infant's cheek or is stroked and then they'll kind of, kind of turn their head towards your hand. Uh, if you put your finger or your hand in a child's hand, they'll often do gripping or they'll squeeze your fingers. Those are things that are infant reflexes where they, they already start to develop these things and you don't have to teach those things. Um, the stepping reflex also as an infant, if they're held kind of upright with their kind of feet placed in the surface, and they'll kind of do this kind of stepping motion or marching motion, um, as well as kind of the storo reflex. Uh, so when we're assessing some of our little babies, some of those things are one of the things that we assess early on where they kind of really track objects with their eyes. Sensory input is also one of those things that are develops very early. So smell, taste, touch, sight, and hearing. Um, whereas an infant, uh, they're born with um, very poor vision. So you have to come very close to their face. So if within a few months of life, they can kind of see objects about eight to 12 inches from their face. Um, and then that skill develops as they, as they grow. Um, same thing with taste and touch, you know, those things also develop with age too. But some, those are some of the earliest developing 
uh, areas of the brain as well as earlier earliest functions. So neurodevelopment, and this is for motion and and kind of broadly speaking. So in general, it's thought that development occurs in a hierarchical manner with the brainstem and cere um, cerebral regions developing first, sorry, cerebellar regions developing first. So around the pons area. Um, and then it goes more to the kind of the midbrain and then the cortex and then the prefrontal cortex is one of the latest developing areas. Um, of more, kind of it goes pons and then it goes kind of more, more posterior than anterior and then frontal. Um, synaptogenesis appears to be simultaneous in multiple areas and layers of the cortex. cortex. So when we think about the pons, this controls kind of this crawling on the belly, um, helps hands and uh, hands to open and close. Um, horizontal eye tracking is all related to this kind of pons development that's about one to five months. The second area of development is that midbrain. So that's around four to 13 months of age. And so this is where you're kind of coordinating eye coordination. So switching from near to far distances, um, hands opening and closing to support your body weight. Um, next to develop is the cortex, and that's around eight to 96 months of age, where you're starting to coordinate upward walking movements, so being able to walk, refining your binocular vision, understanding three dimensions, um, cortical um, kind of uh, hand integration motions, inhibition of subcortical reactions. And the prefrontal cortex goes from about six years to up to 25 years of age. And we all kind of discuss about how the prefrontal cortex is the last area to develop. And this is definitely true. And it, it kind of grows with us as we age. This is our executive functioning, planning, organization, uh, novel problem solving, cognitive, emotional self-regulation. As a four or three-year-old, we don't expect them to be able to control their emotions very well. But as a 25-year-old, we hope that they're not going to be breaking down if they can't get their way, right? Um, working memory is also housed within this area. Consolidation of brain laterality, too, is um, what we see the gen genesis of brain development. So this, and I'm not sure if you can kind of read all this con context, but um, and this is taken from this website below. I put the link down there, but this is, I think, a really great example of what types of development are happening and, and what cognitive or uh, cortex regions are developing at different stages of your life. And you can kind of see some of these things um, throughout kind of uh, before birth. So this line right here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but is the birth. And then this is through infancy, childhood, adolescence, and, and adulthood. What things are developing in different areas? You can see myelination right here starts at infancy and it goes all the way up through your early teens. Synaptic pruning starts a little bit later, but it also continues up until your, your kind of early adulthood as well. Um, and so I think this is a kind of a really good example of what types of cognitive or neuronal activities happening during your brain and what types of uh, functional uh, changes are seen as well. The best way to understand development is to think about um, developmental milestones. And so the CDC just came out with, I think it was last year, new developmental milestone trackers. What would we expect a two month old to do? We want them to be cooing, we want them to turn their head towards sounds. What do we want a four month old to do? We want them to start babbling um, using kind of expressions with their cooing. Sixth month old, we want to see some what types of motor activities and language activities are they doing versus like a nine month old. Um, so the best way to understand 
I think neurodevelopment uh, or typical neurodevelopment is to understand what is expected for that age range. And the best way to do that is to look at developmental milestone guidelines. And so this is kind of just developmental milestones for, for language. There's for motor skills, fine motor skills, gross motor skills to determine what uh, if the child is on track, ahead of track, or behind track in certain areas, and, and how far behind are they? Um, so we're going to go back to this uh, biopsychosocial uh, model, and we're going to discuss what types of things might influence outcome. Um, So the first thing is that social environmental influences. As I mentioned before, this early enriching environment. And often parents are asking me, like, how can I en enrich the environment? And it really is just exposure to different things. So taking your, out, your child out to you know, go to a park or reading to them every day, those are all experiences that, that I had mentioned about that feral children in, where these children were not exposed to anything. They literally were kept alive by just being fed. Um, and so they did not gain any experiences early on. In a rich environment, it's just what you would do on a, a, a normal day-to-day -day life. Factors that influence this may be SES or social economic status, because obviously parents that have are a little bit more wealthy are able to afford different different types of environments and environmental exposures for their for their child. This is also related to parents' income as well as their educational background. So child neglect um, research. Um, so uh, in infancy, social interactions are supported and, and structured within kind of like the family unit. And, and so factors like SES and parental education and income um, are more kind of distal environmental factors, as we mentioned. Proximal environmental factors include parental mental health, uh, family function, and exposure to trauma. So going back to the child neglect research, um, it shows impact in, of kind of social factors on IQ, attention, working memory, self-regulation deficits, and academic achievement. It also has shown kind of structural changes to there's reduced brain volume impacting both gray and white matter uh, connections impacting the medial prefrontal cortex, the orbital prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the, and the corpus callosum. So not only is there functional deficits, so IQ and attention are impacted, but also structural changes are associated with different types of uh, environmental influences or lack thereof. So biological influences, the main things that we often talk about are genetics, um, uh, but it also can be related to brain development. So in this picture was taken from an article from Thompson in Nature 2001, so pretty, um, not a very recent article, but it's things that are kind of a, a, form the basis of our understanding of genetics and how genetics in, can influence um, brain development. So a genetic continuum was detected uh, in which brain structure was increasing, increasingly similar in subjects with increasing genetic um, affinity. So as you can kind of see, these are unrelated subjects. These are fraternal versus identical twins. Genetic factors significantly influence cortical structures in the language area. So Broca's and Wernicke's language areas, as well as the frontal brain regions. So these brain, uh, genetic brain maps revealed how genes determined individual differences uh, and it kind of shed light on the heritability of cognitive and linguistic skills. Uh, so you don't really associate genes with your ability to pick up language, but apparently there is some evidence for that. Um, so if you have a mom or dad that speaks several languages, your chances that you'll be able to pick up languages is much higher. <laughs> so factors that influence outcome following an insult. So this is kind of the main uh, things as a neuropsychologist that you want to know is what 
at what age and uh, what severity and what things, if they have a potentially like a traumatic brain injury or a non-accidental trauma, um, how, what is their outcome going to be? And that is probably uh, the most asked question of a neuropsychologist is what is my child or, or how am I going to come out following this insult, right? So this is a graph and that graph is on your right side from Anderson 2005 and it shows how severe brain injury and early age at injury are associated with kind of poor outcome. So that kind of purpley looking line with the star is that severe you're, you're exposed to an early TBI and your outcome um, changes depending on the severity of the of the insult and when you were uh, exposed to that exposed to that that insult. Things that affect it are obviously the age of insult, the severity, and so um, we talk about a kind of a concussion versus a more severe TBI uh, type of insult. Was it focal or diffuse? especially early on, if it was more diffuse, you'll see worse outcome later on. So some of the worst cases that you might see are those non-accidental trauma cases or kind of shaken baby syndrome, where they have lots of brain damage and you'll see lots of diffuse um, kind of axonal injuries uh, early on, and they usually have the poorest outcome in kind of childhood and adulthood. Sex also apparently has an impact too. So gray matter volume peaks in girls around about age 10, um, whereas it's about age 12 for boys. So the greater dendritic volume in females um, means that girls are more kind of have more bilateral activation on fMRI. So female brains are more diffusely organized and have Research has suggested a greater capacity for functional transfer, greater potential for plasticity and reorganization. Uh, Premorbid characteristics. So there's the, the term called cognitive reserve. So what were you functioning like prior to the insult or injury? If you're functioning higher, the chances that you will gain cognitive skills thereafter are, are also much higher. Um, there is a caveat to this, and we think about this in epilepsy work. Functioning, there's more for you to fall, right? So if you have an IQ of 130, the chances that it will go down, there's a much greater chance that you can fall from a 130 IQ than if you're coming in at a 70 IQ, right? Because the, there's a bottom to the functioning. So some caveats to that. Um, quality of the environment. And so this is whether following the injury, do you have injury? Do you have a stimulating and enriching, enriching environment? Do you have the SES to be able to support therapies? Um, and where insult occurred? And so this, there's a star for this because um, it, there is more specificity as the brain develops later on. So in early childhood, there's less specificity of regional differences. So recovery from early brain insult. So in healthy development, plasticity is a beneficial uh, uh, kind of a beneficial uh, adaptive skill. It's facilitating adaptive changes in response to environmental stimuli, such as kind of routine learning or specific training and en enrichment. With regard to plasticity in an immature brain that has undergone a brain injury, it may not be beneficial. And so this is when we kind of talk about vulnerability, where there may be opportunities to take advantage of the immature immature brains lack of functional specificity, such as kind of transfer of function from damaged to undamaged areas, the brain's capacity for plasticity might also reflect the term kind of vulnerability, which predetermines developmental processes uh, being derailed or neural uh, resources being depleted um, and an absence of neurodevelopmental blueprint to guide 
recovery since the, the brain isn't fully developed. Um, so regarding history, often we associate this, the assessment of uh, Broca. So Broca was one of the first people in the 1800s to uh, observe speech function in a patient with congenital absence of the kind of left frontal lobe. And that's where we associate with language production, right? Um, when Barlow reported observations about a young boy with serial lesions, so first to the left language cortex, who later gained language. And so he was like, oh, so it had transferred, uh, the language had transferred in his, in his brain. Um, but then he lost the skill after he had the lesion in his right hemisphere as well. So Dennis and Whitaker documented relatively intact cognitive and motor skills of children following a hemispherectomy. In contrast, children sustaining more diffuse cerebral insults, such as a TBI, were noted to experience slow and incomplete recovery compared to adults with a similar insult. And so this is what we kind of discussed, whether there potentially is some adaptive, adaptive um, reasons for plasticity, but it also can represent vulnerability. The main thing that we want to discuss with parents often is if a child has an early insult or a TBI or anything like that or a brain tumor, is that we describe it, we don't have a crystal ball, we can't really predict the outcome. Sometimes kids have a better outcome, sometimes kids have a worse outcome and, and we don't actually know, we just have to keep assessing. And for parents, that's a little disheartening because they want to know what's going to what's going to happen. Um, but for kids, it's a little less straightforward. In adults, we can predict with a little bit more certainty the things or the functions that might uh, they might regain. Um, but for kids, it's 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 a little it, it's less certain. Um, so brain development is characterized by increased specialization or fine tuning of response uh, proprieties. Uh, with these properties specific to brain regions and changing as they interact and compete to acquire their role. So support for neuroimaging literature increases, uh, shows increased language, lateral language laterality. So as a epilepsy researcher and clinician, this is really important for us because we wanna know where is language housed and whether it is lateralized to one hemisphere or two. Um, a central concern is the debate in whether specific brain functions are innately specialized to specific brain regions with limited potential for transfer and reorganization, leading ultimately to poor outcome, um, or, if the determ uh, or if the developing brain is, is equal potential with minimal functional localization early, uh, facilitating healthy brain tissue to take up functions uh, that were previously the responsibility of damaged, damaged areas. All right, so clinical implications. Um, most studies of plasticity are from stroke patients, TBI, and epilepsy too. And so since I work with epilepsy, we're going to discuss how this relates in the world of epilepsy. So hopefully we have a lot of epilepsy clinicians or researchers out there because um, this is this is my area. I love talking about this. So uh, what is epilepsy? We're going to go kind of back to the basics. So epilepsy is the most common neurological condition of childhood. Um, epileptic activity and immature brain impacts development of neural, neural networks and the functions dependent on these networks. So um, there are several things that we're kind of kind of discuss is uh, how this could apply clinically and um, both for our surgery patients and our non-surgery patients. So there's different types of epilepsy. There's focal and generalized onset epilepsy. Focal, obviously the term, well actually let's go to the next slide. So generalized onset epilepsy is, uh, there is no focus to where these seizures are coming from. Um, sometimes you'll see kind of motor or non-motor 
uh, movements. So non-motor type of generalized epilepsies are like absence epilepsies. This is very common in adolescence and childhood uh, where it looks like a blank stare. Also very, very comorbid with ADHD and attentive type. Um, but the focal epilepsies is where we can kind of determine whether they are surgery candidate, candidate or not. Uh, some impact awareness and some do not impact their awareness. So some children, even though they're having a seizure, are, are still able to respond to you. Um, some have motor components and some do not. So seizures, epilepsy, and the, the developing brain. So the developing brain is more prone to seizures, especially in infancy. So um, this kind of reflects the immaturity of both signaling systems, developing neurotransmitter, excitatory, and inhibitory systems, and the morphological and structural organization of neural, neural networks, neuronal networks. Uh, so febrile seizures are one of those things where it is fairly common to have febrile seizures as an infant. You grow out of that at a certain time, and it's less common to have these types of seizures later on. Um, but not all patients that have febrile seizures end up developing epilepsy. Um, about only 30% of patients that have febrile seizures end up de developing epilepsy later on. Um, common causes of seizures, the majority of them have an unknown etiology, but in childhood, a lot of them can be associated with head injury, infection, lack of oxygen, kind of disorders of brain development. And so when we talk about this, uh, we talk about things like heterotopias or uh, structural changes or abnormalities to the brain that cause a disruption and then a brain's ability to function and they kind of fire, um, they misfire is essentially what a uh, epilepsy is. And there's also um, genetic components to it. So there's certain genes that are associated with genetic, dis uh, sorry, uh, epilepsy disorders as well. So the importance of neurodevelopment in, neurodevelopment in pediatric epilepsy. Um, and this is really important as part of the surgery team. We want to determine whether a patient is a good surgery candidate. And if we're thinking about neurodevelopment, we want to know where eloquent regions of the brain are. And when we talk about eloquent regions, these are things like your motor areas and your language areas. Psychological testing is consistent with their EG, MRI, or PET. Uh, so this is really important for the neurology team to know is whether we find lateralizing findings. And I can tell you that it is not often that we see um, that our results are consistent with with imaging, um, particularly if it's a young child. And as we mentioned, it's mainly because that the brain specificity is, is not set when they're very young. Um, language, especially for memory, is, is not uh, determined and we don't see strong laterality with, with memory testing early on. So there's certain things that the neuro neurologist will do to help identify where re eloquent regions are. So one of those things is called fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging. And so this helps us determine whether there is language areas in both hemispheres or one hemisphere. We will see that if a child had some type of structural change early on, like a heterotopia or anything like that, uh, or they had some type of insult, like a stroke, early on, especially in their language areas, that they may have bilateral or language or their language has transferred completely over to their other hemisphere. And so those are things that are really important for a neurologist to know, um, especially if they're going to be removing certain areas or sectioning off certain areas of the brain to prevent seizure burden. Another test that neurologists neuropsychologist will help with is a, something called a WADA test. And essentially, we're putting half of the hemisphere to sleep, and we're testing different functions. So we want to see if we can localize 
and lateralize language um, and particularly memory. We don't have great measures to lateralize with the fMRI um, memory for in the fMRI. So the WADA test is usually what we use to help with laterality for, for memory testing. As I mentioned, oftentimes we'll see bilateral activation for language and visual spatial um, memory. And the other task that we do is we use stereotactic EEG to do cortical mapping or passive mapping. And this is kind of the new frontier to neuropsychologists and what we're, we're doing is we're mapping where certain things are in their brain based off of electrical impulses. And so an SCG or kind of depth electrodes are placed into these patients' brains. Um, they're able to record electrical activity, which helps with the neurologist and the neurosurgeon determine where exactly these seizures are coming from. And we can also stimulate these little electrodes to essentially knock out uh, functions. So we usually test patients by, uh, they'll stimulate a certain area of the brain and based off of where we assume certain, ta uh, certain functions should exist, uh, we wanna see if those, those functions are interrupted. Passive mapping is the other component to cortical mapping. And this is essentially where we're just doing baseline testing where we test the patient, um, doing different tasks and seeing gamma activity and high frequency coupling and what uh, what types of uh, high frequency coupling are uh, produced when we're doing different tasks and that is just kind of we call it passive mapping or hfa high frequency activity um, determining what if any of our electrodes are picking up these high frequency activity when we're doing some different tasks and so as a neuropsychologist, these are all of the things, um, particularly for epilepsy, that we're looking at that determine or, or help determine functional, uh, functional tissues of the brain and where things are located. Very important in a child or a or an adolescent because we're not sure exactly where structures are located and functions are located. Um, especially if they've had an early insult or a lesion. We had a patient today that we were doing uh, SEG and cortical mapping with that had several seizures uh, early on. So she had had multiple surgeries to remove the different areas of the brain. And so her structural uh, uh, morphology was very different than what you would expect uh, a typically developing child to look like. And so the neurosurgeon was identifying that he had a hard time identifying where the motor area was, even though uh, in general it should be easy to identify. But for her, it was very abstract because of all of her early insults that she had um, related to those surgery, early surgeries. So neuropsychology plays a really big, important part in especially identifying neurodevelopmental functions uh, early on and thereafter. All right, now I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go through this really quickly. So take home messages, uh, principles of recovery following insults, okay? One, plasticity processes respond differently within healthy versus damaged brains, and everybody already knows that. Um, two, the kind of the neural and functional plasticity are reflected but not synonymous processes, processes with functional recovery, not a necessary consequence of neural recovery. Three, so insult to the immature brain derails subsequent development and impacts on the establishment of functional neural networks causing abnormal functional systems and localization of function. And four, critical periods in development are particularly sensitive to brain insult with the potential for both the kind of the best and worst outcomes during these growth spurts. And five, recovery mechanisms, including both uh, restitution and substitution of function offer little advantage to developing brain over the mature brain. 
six, the full extent of consequences of early brain insult may not be evident until many years post insult when impairments emerge in response to increasing environmental demands. And so this is what we kind of discuss with the term growing into deficit. We don't expect a four year old to be able to kind of control their emotions and their behavior as well as we expect a 16 year old to. Um, and you can kind of see this within some of the tests that you administer yourself is that a four year old, there's lots of, there's not as many tests that we can administer. We can't do very great memory testing on a four year old, whereas we can do pretty good memory testing for a 16 year old. Um, so we can identify a lot more deficits when they're older. And this is just kind of the term kind of growing into deficits. Both injury, it's in seven, so both injury and non-injury factors impact on recovery from early brain insult and are likely to interact in a complex way that may vary according to severity of insult, age, sex, time since insult, and all these other factors. And eight, the impact of early brain insult differs amongst functional domains, so at least in part because of their varied neural representation and developmental trajectories. Run through that really quickly. All right. Thank you so much. Questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ono, for that lecture. I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you all. Thank you so much. We do have some questions in the um, chat box. Um, feel free, please, to put your questions in the Q&A box, and I will ask Dr. Ono, and we'll just do a few questions um, until we reach the hour mark, okay? All right, so first, Dr. Ono, again, thank you so much for um, your lecture. I gained a lot of insight from this. Um, a question that I actually have is, early on, you talked about just the early um, insults for these, for these young, the really the early on kids, and so what does testing look like for those little kids and those developmental milestones that you may be noticing that um, some difficulties may be. And how do you, um, as a neuropsychologist, have that feedback session with a parent and then talk about the trajectory for those kids that you see? Yeah, so if we're talking about someone that's maybe like six months and up, so, um, there's different tests that you can do, but for like six months and younger, there's, uh, standardized testing that we can do, like a Mullins or a Bailey for the, li the little bitties. Um, we can also test reflexes for the really early infants. And so uh, early in some of my training, I did some work in the neonatal clinic where we tested babies that were days old. Um, so we would be testing reflexes. So, so will they be able to track a, a ball? Are they able to track a light? Are they able to respond to sound? So you ring a bell on their side of their head and will they turn their head or they turn their head in that direction? Those are some of the kind of early infant reflexes that we assess. <clears throat> As a child gets a little bit older, there's standardized testing that we can do. So a Mullins or a Bailey, which assess all those different things. So they assess visual spatial processing, they, they assess language. And so Obviously, for a six month old, we don't be expecting them to say complete sentences. Um, it measures things like babbling or cooing um, or response to inhibitory words or things like that, that we expect um, some of our older infants or toddlers to be able to respond to. It also assesses motor skills because those are really important early on. Some of those measures drop off. We don't the WISC, which is our standard IQ test, does not measure motor skills, but for our infants, those are really important. So they assess both gross motor as well as fine motor skills. So the Mullins and the Bailey both do some of those things, in addition to a lot of questionnaires from parents. And so that is one of the main things that we want to rely on is what are parents noticing at home? What are parents' concerns at home? Whether they see that um, children have are using one hand versus the other, um, because early uh, preference is, is not identified. So we want them to be, be able to use both hands in tandem, things like that. Uh, responding to how you would uh, discuss it with parents, it's, you know, they're coming in either, 
oftentimes knowing that there is some concern, right? And so they, um, not all the time, but I'm going to say most of the time, um, are more concerned than some of the results might show. Um, so usually it's, it's good news that we're saying like, oh, your child is kind of within the developmental uh, framework where we would expect. Um, but sometimes they aren't, right? They're falling behind in certain areas and we want to make sure that they do lots of early interventions. So the, especially for our little bitties, the main thing that we want them to do is therapies. So we will often recommend PT, OT, speech. Any of those early interventions are kind of key for development. And when we talk about exposure, that is one of the best things to get a child exposed is those early therapies. Okay, thank you so much for that. I have another question um, from the um, Q&A group and it actually ties right on into this. So there's a question about the CDC developmental milestones. And so that was very in insightful. And I think a lot of us can really use that. That'll be helpful. What was the difference? So you mentioned that there was a change in the CDC developmental milestones. What was the reason for that change and the purpose for the update? Well, there wasn't a change. It was just kind of like an updated, um, they just wanted to update to make sure it's more specific. And so they just updated it, I think maybe about a year ago. So if you just look on this, there is a tracker too. So I even put in my recommendation section for, especially for our parents with young children, refer to this website to see where your child falls and whether to bring them in if, if your child is not meeting these developmental milestones. Um, so it's a way for parents or giving parents a tool to be able to assess their own child. And if they have concerns or if they're not meeting these milestones based off of this tracker, I need to come bring them in to see a neuropsychologist to see if there is true challenges that we need to address. Okay, thank you for that. That's helpful. And I think that's definitely really helpful for parents as well to have that in the recommendation section so they can see typically where their child should be following along the developmental milestones. Okay. I know you mentioned that um, your research, a lot of your clinical work is within the field of epilepsy. And so with that comes a lot of the understanding of the lateralization, localization to help the neurology team. Mm -hmm. How beneficial um, is the neuropsych um, data and how does that align? I know you mentioned the different other types of um, like fMRI, ICEG. Um, how does the team incorporate the neuropsych data when things don't match up exactly? How does that work? So um, if we do not match up with imaging, so let's say imaging and EEG say that there's a left hemisphere involvement and all of our results look like there's visual spatial processing challenges and languages is intact. Um, then then we want they refer them to fri because we're like hey we don't see what you are seeing maybe language is housed somewhere else other than the left hemisphere sometimes it is consistent with what we're identifying where language will be in two, two hemispheres and some of my trainees know that early on i think we had maps maybe four kids and they all had bilateral language right and that's not something that you would expect uh, you want to see it in the left hemisphere solely. Um, but language moves. And we also see this with our bilingual kids, too. And even if they didn't have an early insult, they'll often have bilateral language activation in two hemispheres. Um, and they're exactly where you would expect. So, you know, where Broca's area is in your left hemisphere, it's it's kind of that Broca's area in your right hemisphere, too, right? Um, so the team uses our information to help guide what additional uh, tests we need to do to localize or identify where eloquent regions are. So that's why we do the fMRI, we do the cortical mapping, we do the WADA testing too, to see if we can kind of identify those regions. So we are, um, even if we don't match up with them, we are very helpful to the team. Okay, okay, thank you. And then I have one last question. And I think this is a really great way to tie it all together. It's about um, SEG, the cortical mapping. And this question is mainly asking, is this testing readily available for all populations, 
when we're thinking about some of those marginalized populations, low income, BIPOC populations, um, is this testing ready available? Is it very expensive? Insurance coverage, all that that goes into being able to have that access. So I'm not sure about insurance coverage, and it really depends on where the patient is located and their access to the hospitals. Uh, there are most places do these regularly. Um, however, as you know, large hospitals uh, that have an epilepsy center will do SCG regularly. Um, but it really depends on where the, the patient is located and um, and their access to what which hospital they they have access to. So I'm not entirely sure if I answered that question <laughs> or not. Um, but you know, I, I do feel that the, the patients that are underserved or potentially in a very rural area would have to travel long distances for treatments like this to be able to have access to treatments like this. Yeah, as a trainee, I've seen, I'm in the Georgia area training and I've seen that some patients have to travel like you know two hours just for testing. And so if they have to have these additional um, tests to the access there to be able to get to a major hospital to receive that. So thank you so much, Dr. Ono. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. And um, I'm very excited um, that you joined us today and we all learned so much from this lecture. Thank you so much. Okay, so next week we will pick up again with our second lecture of No Neuroanatomy and we will be um, met with Dr. Kristen Crossfer and she will be talking about the brainstem. So next week um, at 7 p.m. we will have um, our next lecture about the brainstem. Again, thank you all so much for joining us and you all have a wonderful day.